So, you know, let's skip this boring stuff. I just want to ask, who here has already read the monkey book? Keep your hands up if you like it. <laughs> I'm watching. Awesome. <laughs> the rest of you with your hands down, you know what to do, right? I, I don't have to say it aloud. Okay, cool. I love domain driven design, but today I'm going to talk about something else. Another topic that I'm really fascinated about. And actually, this talk, Balancing Coupling in Software Design, I gave it at DDD Europe 2020, before pandemic, before lockdowns, before all that crazy stuff. And back then, Rebecca Wiersbrock told me that you got to keep working on those ideas and turn this into a book. So a year later, that opportunity came, came by, and right now I'm working on that book with the same title. So today I'm going to give you a version two of that presentation, much improved in my opinion with more advanced ideas. And the goal is to give you a glimpse into the contents of this book. Now, this is not going to be a sales teaser. My goal is not to convince you to buy it because then you will start asking me when it's going to be published, how long should we wait? And I, at this point of time, I try to avoid this, answering these questions. So instead, I want to give you some practical tools that you can apply in your day-to-day -day life. So let's start. Coupling. There is one quote that I've been using almost all of my presentations lately. And in this one, I decided why should we wait till the middle? Let's put it right there on the first slide. So here it is. Ruth Milan, she says, system design is inherently about boundaries. What's in, what's out, what spends, what moves between, and it's about trade-offs. It reshapes what is outside just as it shapes what is inside. And I wanted it right here on the first slide because it outlines the overall topic of this presentation, system design, but, but more specifically, those relationships that span across boundaries of components involving the thing we fear the most, coupling. And, you know, we've been told that coupling is scary, it's bad, it slows us down. And to be honest, when working on a system that resists changes we are trying to make, we are going to blame it first and foremost on coupling. As a result, not surprisingly, what do we want to do about coupling? We want to terminate it. We want to decouple everything. We want to break all bigger systems apart into those tiny, tiny boxes, and they can be objects, classes, services, microservices, or serverless functions, whatever. The motivation is always the same. We want to be able to change every one of those little boxes independently. Now, when we are focusing on the size of a box, usually we go from piled, uh, sorry, coupled piles of code to distributed piles of code. <laughs> and that's not surprising because as Matthias says, going for as small as possible is almost universally a bad advice in software design. Also, Nick Tune says, there are many useful and revealing heuristics for defining the boundaries of a service. Size is one of the least useful. And yet, we keep on doing that. So I know it may sound somewhat controversial, but in the next 40 minutes or so, I want to give you a different perspective on coupling. I want to show you a different way of thinking about coupling, and I will even try to convince you that we can use those insights provided by coupling for designing modular systems. So overall, that's our agenda. We'll, we're going to start by defining what coupling is. Next, you're going to see how coupling manifests itself in software design and it's going to happen in multiple dimensions. And finally, we're going to connect all that knowledge and build a framework or a design heuristic for uh, designing modular software systems. So first question is, what is coupling? 
And if we go to the lexical origins of that word, it will take us all the way back to Latin, where it was composed from co and opera, co opera, meaning fasting together. In other words, if two things are coupled, it simply means that they are connected. And that makes coupling pretty much ubiquitous phenomena. It is everywhere. This clicker, it is coupled to my computer. Organs in our bodies are coupled to each other to form us. Living organisms producing code or, uh, in, my in my case right now, stress hormones. <laughs> anyway, any kind of system, whether it's a company, a vehicle, car, or an organism, or a city, any kind of system is held together by coupling. You cannot build a system out of independent components. If the components are completely disconnected, that's not a system. That's just a bunch of components in some bag. The overall value is the value of the sum of the components. However, if we introduce connections between them, if they're working, to, uh, working together to, uh, to achieve some overarching goal, then suddenly the value is going to be higher than the sum of the parts. The system will produce more value, and that value is driven by those connections. So they are somewhat important. So instead of trying to decouple everything, let's accept the fact that coupling is an inherent part of system design. We cannot build a system without it. So instead of trying to eliminate it, let's try to analyze the relationships between the components and see if they are working for us or against us. And if it's the later case, then let's see how we can turn it around. What changes can we make to the design of those connections to force them to work for us? Now, let's define some terminology, a ubiquitous language for our bounded context. <laughs> let's say that we have two components. We have downstream component that depends on the upstream component. And that relationship, that arrow between them, it defines how these components are connected. It defines how change in the upstream is likely to call cascading changes and break the integration with its downstream components. In other words, if you're making a change to the upstream, how much risk is going to be involved there? If the chances are that any change any change to the upstream component is going to result in cascading changes to downstream components, then they are uh, tightly connected or tightly coupled. As Michael Nygaard says, coupling defines the component's degrees of freedom. How freely the components are able to change without affecting other parts of the system. Now, it may it may sound limiting that coupling limits our degrees of freedom, but on the other hand, you know, we don't want unlimited degrees of freedom in a system. A system with unlimited degrees of freedom is going to be a chaotic system. <laughs> there will be no governing rules there. So we do want some constraints. So when designing these relationships, coupling between components, it's important to, um, to understand what Ch changes do we want to allow, and what are the changes that we, want, we are not going to need? So if we can prohibit all the degrees of freedom that are not required, that um, we won't need in the future, the overall system is going to be easier to predict, easier to evolve, and overall its complexity is going to be lower. Now, the, th the interesting thing about coupling is that it's not some unidimensional phenomenon like we have two components connected or not connected, and that's it, coupled or decoupled. Instead, we can observe the effects of coupling in a system in three dimensions. Dimensions of strength, distance, and volatility. We can say that it's space, time, and gravitational force, the combination of these two. So let's go over these dimensions. We're going to start with strength. Now, I have to warn you, it's going to be a heavy one. Here, we're going to spend quite a lot of time. We're going to, to do a little journey back through time to learn about things that we've forgotten already. 
some models that were used to evaluate coupling in 70s, 80s, 90s, and are not that really popular nowadays. nowadays. So no need to try and remember everything. Okay? We're going to go over the coupling in structure design and a model called Kinescence. Try to focus on the different levels of these models and try to understand the, the differences between them. Like one one is considered higher than the previous one. What is the difference in, uh, in complexity that each level introduces to the system? And also think about the interfaces that the components are using to connect to each other, whether they are explicit or implicit. Later on, we're going to combine them into another framework, and I'll tell you when it's time to start uh, remembering things. <laughs> so let's start. And you know what I'm going to ask you? Anybody here familiar with structure design? Oh, that's a record. <laughs> Canescence? Yeah, that's the special thing about DDD Europe. <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's go over these models. So structure design, this methodology was introduced back in the 60s. You're probably not going to be able to find these books on Kindle, but if you do manage to find this one and you just ignore its publishing date and you read about the problems in software design that this book tries to address, it kind of looks too familiar to our days. So structure design. That methodology proposed these six levels of interconnectedness, of strength of connections between components. Uh, content, common, external, control, stamp, and data coupling. Now, these terms may sound somewhat uh, unintuitive. That's because they are based on languages such as COBOL and Fortran. So let's see what they mean. The first one and the strongest one is content coupling. The idea here is pretty simple. One module uses implementation details of another, one, another module to communicate with it. In other words, it is using some information that was never intended for integration. Back in those days, a typical example would be a go-to statement. Like, I have a go-to statement that says, next execution should go to line number something. And if the order of lines changes in that second module, well, surprises are upon us. Things are going to break. These systems are not going to work. So this type of integration is quite, quite fragile. Now, luckily, we are not doing uh, go-to statements so much today, <laughs> but we have our ways, right? For example, we can introduce Content coupling if we, for example, use reflection to read value of a private field or call a private method. That would be content coupling because probably there was a reason why that field or method were declared as private. So that's content coupling. Modules are common coupled when they communicate through a global, globally accessible shared memory space. That memory space is some unstructured byte array. So the two connected modules have to duplicate that knowledge of how the data in that shared memory is structured. Now, today, an example of common coupling would be, let's say we have two services communicating with each other by reading and writing to the same file in S3 bucket. There is no way to enforce a structure to that file, so the two services have to hold that knowledge. So, as a result, they're common coupled. That's pretty high here on this scale. Slightly lighter is external coupling. Here, the components are still communicating through a global memory, but now there is some structure to it. Now, they're reading or writing to a primitive or an array of primitives. So there is some kind of enforcement of the data format in that shared memory space. Again, if we go fast forward to our days, an example of ex external coupling would be two services working with the same database. And that database enforces a schema of how that data is structured there. 
Control coupling is somewhat fuzzy. This one means that we have two components or two modules and they are not encapsulating their business logic properly, meaning that one of them tells the second component how to do its, its job. The implication is that when the business requirements are going to change that functionality, the two connected modules are probably going to change together. So this one more, is more about functionality and a poor encapsulation of that functionality in a single module. Stem couple modules are communicating by exchanging data records. These records are data structures containing way more information than is actually needed for integration. Say I'm working with a CRM module and I'm asking it for an email address of a customer. Instead, I'm going to get like data structure containing dozens or hundreds of other fields. Eventually, I will find that email there. It's there. However, sharing all that extraneous information across the boundary of a module makes the downstream components more uh, sensitive to changes in the data structures of the upstream component. If there is a change, we have a slightly higher chances that that change is going to affect one of the downstream components that are aware of that structure, of that knowledge. And finally, data coupling. This one is the lowest level and the most desirable level of coupling in structured design. Here, the modules are communicating by passing arguments with integration-related data only. In other words, this level, according to the, on this level, the integration protocol is both explicit is well documented and it's minimized. It contains the minimal amount of knowledge that is needed for the components to work together. Or in other words, it says that the upstream component encapsulates as much knowledge as it can. So overall, these levels uh, reflect how much implementation details are shared across boundaries. So if you go to content coupling, all the way up there, we are using implementation details for integration. So we have to assume as if all implementation details are shared across the boundary of the upstream component, all the way to bottom data coupling where we minimize that knowledge that is being shared across the boundaries of components. Now, these levels were introduced in late 60s, early 70s, and in the 90s, Miller Page Jones proposed a different way of measuring coupling, and this one was a more oriented towards object oriented programming paradigm. He called it kinescence. This word, again, comes from Latin, and it means uh, having been born together. According to the author of this model, two components can be considered as being born together or kinescent if a change in one of them requires a change in the second component, or if you can postulate a reasonable change that will require both components to be modified. Now, reasonable is an important word. It has to be a reasonable change, something that the business may, may be interested in in the future. For example, turning a CRM system into a printer driver, that's not a reasonable change. <laughs> and in this model, Kinescence, we have a bit more levels. We have nine levels of overall, and they are divided into two types, static Kinescence and dynamic Kinescence. The static levels are compile time dependencies, meaning that we can observe them by reading the code, and then we have dynamic Kinescence, uh, four additional levels that describe runtime relationships between components of a system. Let's start with static one. And here, the lowest one is connaissance of name. It, mean, it simply means that uh, in order for the code to work, you need to know the name of a variable. That's it. If you're reading value of variable, you need to know its name. That's the lowest level possible. Uh, that's also the lowest amount of knowledge that can be shared according to this model, the name of the variable. The next one, connaissance of type, is pretty much almost the same as connaissance of name, 
it means that you also need to know the type of that variable that you're about to read. Except for very rare cases, you do need to know the type. So usually these two come, come together, and I've seen some, some are even using a, um, the term connaissance of name and type, as if they're one unit. So again, although it's slightly lower on the scale, it's almost the same as connaissance of name. Connaissance of meaning happens when conventions are used to assign meanings to values. And a typical example here is this status equals seven, this magic number. If we have two components that are communicating with each other by passing this value, status equals seven, mm -hmm. both of them have to know what that seven means, right? They have to duplicate that knowledge. And that makes them connaissance by meaning. Next one is connaissance of algorithm. And here we have two modules or two components that have to agree on the use of a specific algorithm in order to understand each other. For example, let's say we have two modules communicating by exchanging encrypted data. They better agree on the encryption algorithm they're going to use. Because if they don't, good luck to them. Uh, so that makes them connaissant by algorithm. Now, there is a very common misconception about this level, and I've heard many people say that it's about implementation of an algorithm. That the same algorithm is implemented in the two components. That's not the case. Implementing the same algorithm in two components would lead to duplicated business logic, and that would put us way higher than level four out of nine. We'll get to that in a few minutes. So again, in essence of algorithm, we just have to agree on what algorithm we're going to use to understand each other. And finally, the highest level of steady connaissance is connaissance of position. And here we have uh, components that passing values uh, as an array of values where the meaning of each value is defined by its position in that array. The best example I can think of it is, let's say we have a send email method that accepts four arguments of type string, to, from, subject, and body. And because it's the same type, it makes it really easy to uh, put them in incorrect order, uh, ca cause an incorrect behavior of the system, and of course, uh, learn about it only after deploying it to production <laughs> or test environment. So that's connaissance of position, an integration method that makes it easy to uh, cause incorrect behavior of a system but by putting values in an incorrect place in an array. So these are the level, levels of static connaissance. Five compile time dependencies that reflect how explicit or implicit an integration interface is. Now, let's see the levels of dynamic connaissance. Here we have only four, only four levels. And the first one is connaissance of execution. Here we have a set of operations that must be executed in a specific order, like a recipe. They have to be followed exactly step by step. Say we're working with, the, with a database. First, we have to open a connection, then we begin a transaction, then we execute a query, then we commit a rollback that transaction, and then we are closing the connection. So these five operations have to be executed exactly in that order. If we are going to close the connection and then open it, well, we are going to end up with a behavior that wasn't intended. So that makes these operations connaissant by execution. A closely related level is connaissance of timing. And here we have a time-based dependency between two behaviors. Go, going back to the example of a database, let's say we open a connection, and then nothing happens for 30 seconds. And, we, and after that, we have to call timeout connection method, because nothing happened after 30 seconds. And that time interval between them of 30 seconds makes them connaissant by Timing. We have that time period that connects two behaviors of a system. 
almost the strongest level is kinescence of value. And here we have values that have to change together, meaning there is a business invariant or a rule that dictates that a number of values have to change as one atomic transaction, or otherwise the system is going to be in an incorrect state. As an example, consider we have a data structure that describes three edges of a triangle. If we're going to change one of the values, we also have to adjust, adjust the other two. If we don't, that's not going to be a mathematically correct triangle. And that makes these three values connascent by value. And finally, the highest level is connascence of identity. And here we have two objects that must reference and work with the same instance of another object. A trivial example here would be, let's say, we have two modules working on the same set of data. They're modifying the same business entity. So they have to work with the same database that's going to store that data. If they don't, if, for example, each one, of, each one of them is going to have its own local copy of the data and they are not synchronized it in any way, then the system is going to be in incorrect state. So that's the highest level on connaissance scale, connaissance of identity, when, where something else, like a third object, should be shared between the connected modules. So these are the levels of dynamic connaissance. Lowest one, execution, in which operations have to be executed in a specific order. And the highest one, identity, where we have to reference the same instance of something else. There is some other entity or an object that connects the, connect uh, the two modules. Now, it may seem that we can find some similarities between these two models, structure design and connaissance. However, they're quite different and they reflect different aspects of design. And also both of them have some blind spots. For example, let's say I have a module that executes a private method of another module through reflection. Where does that put me on the structure design scale? Content, yes. I'm using something that was not intended for me, an implementation detail. So I'm going way up to the top of structured design scale. What about kinescence? What do I need to know to call? A yes, exactly. I need to know the name. So one model says that I'm on the lowest level. The other one says that I'm on the highest level. Of course, I'm going to ignore structure design. I'm going to say this model is better. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding. That's not because one model is better, the other is worse. It's just that they are reflecting different aspects of coupling, of manifestations of coupling. So you know what? Earlier I said that coupling was introduced in late 60s, kinescence in 90s. So we have that cadence of 30 years that makes it now a good time to start thinking about different ways of evaluating coupling. So I want to show you a model that I've been using for quite some time, and I find it a bit easier to use and easier to introduce to a project. And it's basically a remix of the previous two models. Oh, and I said that I will go I'm going to tell you when it's time to start remembering things. Now's the time. <laughs> so, integration strength. This model has four basic levels. Intrusive, functional, model, and contract coupling. That's all we need, basically. As the name suggests, intrusive coupling is the highest level of coupling, and it's synonymous with structure designs content coupling. Modules are integrated through private interfaces, and they're introducing dependencies on implementation details. Needless to say that such integration method is both fragile and implicit 
the authors of that upstream modules may not even be aware of the integration taking place. So they're just doing their job every day, changing some implementation details, and then suddenly something unexpected breaks in some other system. So it's a very fragile way of integrating systems or components in a system. Here we have to assume as if all knowledge about how that upstream is implemented is shared across the boundary. Next one of functional coupling means that the connected components are implementing closely related business functionalities. The practical implication is that the same change in the business requirements is going to affect both components. They both will have to change simultaneously. Now, if we are designing modules and we want them to be a sort of independent, that's not where we want to be because this level introduce, introduces cascading changes. In essence, all the levels of dynamic connaissance, execution timing, uh, value, and identity, all of them belong to this level of functional dependencies. Now, also, an extreme example of functional coupling would be two components implementing the same business rule or the same business algorithm. And in this case, if the requirements for that algorithm change, they have to change together. And to make matters even a bit more implicit, they don't have to be physically connected. This can be completely decoupled, seemingly independent modules of a system. But if business requirements change, and we have to change them simultaneously, because otherwise the system is going to end up in an incorrect state, well, even though they're, they're not physically connected, we still have a pretty strong connection between them. A lower level of integration strength is model coupling. This one means that the components, the connected components, are using or sharing the same model of the business domain. What I love about DDD conferences is that I don't have to explain what a model is, <laughs> why it is important, and what is a bounded context, yeah. So it's about reusing the same model between different uh, modules, whether it's the same service or between different services. If they rely on the same model, they are model uh, coupled through the model. If we want to evolve it over time, because we all know it's important, um, it can be challenging be because of such integrations. And then, of course, we are going to say, well, yeah, I think we should be pragmatic here. We should leave this model as it is. And don't do that. <laughs> now, linking back to kinescence, all the levels of steady kinescence, they can be used to describe the, these dependencies of model coupling. We can, have, uh, we can share the names and types that are used in the model, and we can go all the way up to uh, meaning, algorithms, position, et cetera. And finally, the lowest level, level of integration strength is contract coupling. Here, the components are integrated through an explicit integration-specific model that is decoupled from the implementation details, meaning that the implementation model can evolve, but those changes are not going to uh, affect the integration contract. And then, well, the upstream module have more freedom to change as they need without being afraid of bre breaking those integrations in other components. And since we're a domain-driven design conference, uh, open host service, published language, anti-corruption layer, all these patterns are about introducing contract coupling, or in other words, decoup uh, reducing coupling to a model of the upstream. So these are the four, four levels of integration strength. Overall, the differences between them is the amount of knowledge that is shared across the boundary. Intrusive, the highest one, we're assuming as if all knowledge is shared, and contract minimizes the knowledge as much as possible. Now, we can also use this, uh, these levels to evaluate how implicit or explicit the integration interfaces are. Again, going back to the extreme example of intrusive coupling, up there, 
it's pre pretty implicit because the authors of the upstream may, may be unaware of the integration taking place. So that's as implicit as it can be. Whereas contract introduces an integration specific model, so it is an explicit effort to reduce the knowledge that is being shared across the boundaries. Now, let's say that we have two components and they're connected through intrusive coupling, meaning that one of them is doing something um, that they were not supposed to do. Is that a bad design or not? What do you think? Is it a bad design? Is it not necessarily bad design? It depends. <laughs> yeah, it depends. <laughs> Let's see what it depends on. And for that, we have to explore another dimension in which we can observe coupling or effects of coupling, and that's distance or physical location of components in a system. And the thing is, the connections between the components, they can span different distances in code bases. These distances are usually related to what we call uh, levels of abstraction. We can have coupling between methods, between objects, between uh, namespaces, components, services, microservices, or whole systems. So the farther we go on that level of abstraction scale, the higher the distance. Anybody want, want to take a guess what is on the vertical axis? What grows simultaneously with the distance? Time? In what sense? Response, Response yes. <laughs> yeah, it's the effort we need to invest if we need to implement a change that uh, affects two connected components. The longer the distance, the more coordination effort we need to invest, and that will obviously require more time. So obviously, if we have to modify two methods in the same class, it's going to be way easier, and the communication effort is going to be way lower than if we have to, uh, to implement a change that affects two microservices simultaneously. So we can say that the cost of a change is proportional to the distance between the affected components. Now, that's not the only interesting, interesting effect of distance. There is another one that goes in another direction, and that's life cycle coupling. In other words, how interrelated their life cycles are. As the components are located closer to each other, the higher the chances that changing one of them will inadvertently affect other components. For example, if you're changing a method of a class, chances are that you will also need to change other methods in the same class. And the closer these affected components are to each other, the higher the probability for such a collateral cascading changes. Now, furthermore, of course, if components are located close to each other, or the closer they are to each other, the higher the chances that they will have to be tested, uh, deployed, and overall evolved simultaneously. Now, the interesting thing about distance is it's not only affected by the physical locations of components in a code base, but also by the organizational structure. Let's say that we have two components on this microservices level right here, on the far right. And let's say we have two cases. One of them, we have two microservices implemented by the same team, and, the, uh, and in the second case, we have two microservices implemented by two different teams. With two teams, we definitely have a higher coordination overhead if we need to modify them simultaneously and we have lower life cycle coupling. Thus, overall, we are, we are getting larger distance, despite the fact that they are both somewhat on the same level of abstraction. Now, let's say that we have this example. So we have two systems functionally coupled, and since these are systems, 
we have a pretty high distance between them. Meaning that if they have to change together, it's going to require quite a lot of effort to coordinate that change. And I want to ask you the same question. Is it necessarily a bad design? You know the answer. Yes, let's see what it depends on. <laughs> and it depends on the third dimension, the dimension of time or volatility. And the main question we have to ask here is how often does that upstream component actually change? You know, as they say, if a tree falls in a forest and nobody's around to hear it fall, does it make a sound? Same as here. If we have some terrible design of those interactions, but the upstream component is never going to change, then let's see how it affects the overall design. So we have to know, or we have to be able to estimate how often uh, the upstream component is going to change. Now, of course, predicting future is not easy, but we have some models we can do, we can use to try and estimate the rate of expected changes. And of course, since we are at Domain Driven Design Conference, subdomains, we can use subdomains to evaluate the expected rate of changes. We all know that we have three types of subdomains, core, supporting, and generic. Core is all about com the company's competitive advantage, how it competes with other companies in the same field or the same industry. The opposite of a core subdomain is generic subdomain. And here we have a solved problem, a solution that is out there. We can use it, our competitors can use it, and nobody really cares because it doesn't really affect the competitiveness of a company. And finally, we have supporting subdomains, which are somewhere in the middle. It's something that we have to implement ourselves. There is no ready-made solution available, but the company would love supporting subdomain to be a generic one for some day for some company to come up with a generic implementation so that they can will be able to throw away their own implementation and use that one. Usually when dealing with supporting subdomains, these are simple things like CRUD data entry interfaces, ETL jobs, stuff like that. Whereas core subdomains are more uh, complex. Here we have innovations, we have new algorithms, some smart ways to optimize the performance of a company compared to other players in the field, etc. As a result, that's where we should expect the highest volatility. This is what the company is interested in optimizing, core subdomains. So if the upstream component is generic or supporting, we can expect much lower rate of changes in it than in the case of core. If it's core, is going to change the most. So these are the three dimensions of coupling that describe the nature of a relationship between two components. Now let's see the interesting things we can, the interesting insights we can get by combining them together. So first, strength and volatility. The higher the strength, the higher the, ch the probability of cascading changes happening across the system. The higher the volatility, the more often we'll have to take care of those cascading changes. So if both are high, we get a high maintenance effort. Strength and distance. Distancing the components physically increases the coordination effort that is needed to implement a change that affects two components. High integration strength over high distance makes the system expensive to change and to evolve over time. And finally, distance and volatility, these two reflect the coordination effort that is needed to evolve the system. If both are high, we should expect communication overload, like frequent communications between different teams. Now, that's still not the whole picture. To get the whole picture, we have to combine three of them together, <laughs> and that allows us to evaluate the pain we're going to endure when we'll have to maintain a relationship between the two components. And that pain can be evaluated simply by multiplying the three values. The pain is strength of the relationship 
times volatility of relationship times distance between these components. Now, if you want to minimize that pain, what should we do? Yes, one of them should be zero. Exactly, that's all we need. Let's see some examples. Let's say that we are reducing strength to zero. In that case, it's okay to have high volatility over high distance. The strength, the lowest strength, uh, minimizes the chances of those cascading changes happening in the system. If, on the other hand, uh, both strength and volatility are high, we can reduce the distance between them. Yes, the upstream is going to change frequently, and yes, uh, those changes are going to affect the downstream component as well, because strength is high as well. That's true. But because the distance is low, they're located close to each other, so coordination effort is low, and the cost of implementing the change will go down. In other words, this relationship is what we usually call high cohesion. And finally, if the volatility is zero, high strength over high distance won't really affect you. That's, let's say, a pragmatic relationship. Let's say you are integrating a, with a legacy system and you're just go, going to its database and getting the data from there. So that's intrusive coupling, right? High strength. Because it's a different system, the distance is high as well. But you know that it's a legacy, it's not going to be changed, so volatility is zero, go ahead and do it. So overall, the algorithm to minimize pain is to eliminate, eliminate all accidental knowledge that is shared across boundaries of the upstream component as much as possible. Now, it's not always going to be possible to reduce it uh, to the lowest level, contract coupling. No, it's not going to happen because sometimes you do need functional dependency or you need to reuse the same model. So if all, fa if all else fails, if you have high strength and high volatility, reduce the distance. Bring these components together. Now we have a minute and a half. Let's go quickly through an example. Databases. Everybody says that you shouldn't use another microservices database directly because it's a big no-no. Let's analyze that. So first, if we're talking about microservices, the database was never intended for integration, that's right. That puts us on the intrusive coupling. It's an implementation detail that we are using without permission. If, on the other hand, we have two components that and their authors made that decision um, made the decision to use the same database because they have the reasons that puts us on the functional coupling level. Now, on the other hand, let's say that the database belongs to operational system, and on the other side we have a BI department. Now, what do they love to do? They love to go to the database, copy all the data, and then if you change their model, then suddenly you have drama in the corridors because that's model coupling. <laughs> They're coupling themselves to the model of that operational system. And finally, if the database was intended for integration, it contains data for integration purposes, like in data mesh approach, that's contract coupling, even though that's physical database that's being shared. Let's go quickly to another example. Domain-driven design because, yeah, we're at DDD conference. Aggregates, what aggregates do? They reduce the distance. They put things that have high functional strength close to each other because we have some transactional dependencies there. Uh, we also have high volatility because usually aggregates belong to core subdomains. For supporting subdomains, we usually say this is the place where we can round some corners. This is the place where we can use some a rapid application development framework because the volatility is lower in a supporting subdomain. And as I mentioned before, anti-corruption layer, open host service, and published language patterns are all about minimizing the knowledge that is shared across large distances, or in DDD terms, between different bounded contexts. 
And with that, I'm going to skip the summary slides. I will just say that pain depends on the three values. Uh, my own pain at this moment is right there. Yeah, here it is. <laughs> One day I hope to finish it. Uh, yeah, if you have questions, I'm here. Thank you. <laughs>